The Eye, Part Two, Biochemistry. You may remember a famous quote by Richard Dawkins, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. That's, of course, from The Blind Watchmaker, page one. And uh, you can look it up if you want to. Um, Dawkins is now um, uh, sacred enough that they've actually put his book online even though he still gets royalties from it, so. Uh, uh, another quote, again, from an evolutionist, the problem of plan and purchase, purpose in nature, the problem of plan, think about that. <laughs> plan and purpose in nature is a problem. And uh, he starts out, telescope, a telephone, or a typewriter is a complex mechanism serving a particular function. Obviously, its manufacturer had a purpose in mind, and the machine was designed and built in order to serve that purpose. An eye, an ear, or a hand is also a complex mechanism serving a particular function. In the case of a hand, multiple functions. This appearance of purposefulness this appearance of purf purposefulness is pervading in nature. In the general structure of animals and plants, which we looked at the general structure of the eye last week, in the mechanism of their various organs and in the give and take of their relationships with each other, it looks like purpose all around. Accounting for this apparent purposefulness is a basic problem for any system of philosophy or of science. Of course, for a theistic one, it's not a problem. It's a feature, but anyway. Um, now, <clears throat> as many of you know, on the origin of species or the pre preservation of favored races by Charles Darwin, which again can be found on the internet, a couple of different places. And the last one I think is actually just flat out PDF of the book itself. Um, now I'm going to go to Darwin's black box, which I think I may have forgotten to put the, the reference in. Those of you who got the email have the reference. Uh, uh, Darwin's black box by Michael Behe. Darwin persuaded much of the world that a modern eye evolved gradually from a simpler structure. But he did not even try to explain where his starting point, the relatively simple light sensitive spot came from. On, on the contrary, Darwin dismissed the question of the eye's ultimate origin. And I'm going to give not just Behe's quote of Darwin, but I'm going to give you a, the, the complete part of that quote. How a nerve can t comes to be sensitive to light hardly concerns us more than how life itself first originated. He had no clue. He didn't try, which is probably good for him. I mean, don't go beyond your knowledge. But he did go beyond his knowledge by speculating, I may remark that several facts make me suspect that any sensitive nerve may be rendered sensitive to light and likewise to those coarser vibrations of the air which produce sound. Any sensitive nerve. So if you have a touch sensation nerve or pain sensation nerve or something like that, wait a little while and um, the right pigment will get on it and it will turn into a light sensitive nerve. Sounds like what Behe called Calvinism. Not John Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a box and you jump into it and you can fly. Transmogrify it, that's right. Um, now, Darwin's black box continues. He had, uh, Darwin had an excellent reason for declining the question. It was completely beyond 19th century science. How the eye works, that is, what happens when a photon of light first hits the retina, simply could not be answered at that time. We're talking about a simple light sensitive spot. To Darwin, vision was a black box. But, after the cumulative hard work of many biochemists, we are now approaching answers to the question of sight. The following five paragraphs give a biochemical sketch of the eye's operation. And I'm going to give you one of his biochemical paragraphs. 
It'll be in two parts here. When light first strikes the retina, a photon interacts with a molecule called N cis retinol. Actually, it's N11 cis retinol, but whatever. Uh, which rearranges uh, within picoseconds to transretinal. A picosecond is about the time it takes for light to travel the breadth of a single human hair. We're talking fast. The change in the shape of the retinal molecule forces a change in the shape of the protein, rhodopsin, to which the retinol is tightly bound. The protein's metamorphosis alters its behavior. Now called metarhodopsin 2, same protein, just a straighter retinol in the middle of it. Transducin, oh, pardon me, uh, the protein sticks to another protein called transducin. Before bumping into metarhodopsin 2, the transducin had tightly bound a small molecule called GDP. But when transducin interacts with metarhodopsin 2, the GDP falls off, and a molecule called GTP binds to transducin. GTP is closely related to, but critically different from GDP. Now, uh, it goes on from there. This is just one-fifth of the complications. Okay, we're going to take the tour down through the micro, micro of the eye. First, we start with the eye, and we're going to be looking at this layer down here. That's the one that senses the light. And you can see that here are all these rods and cones down here with other layers in between and ganglion cells and they're all connected with each other and they, they are already processing the light signal before the, eye, uh, before the signal ever leaves the back of the eye. And then this heads off to the optic nerve and then to the brain. We're going to look at these cells right in here uh, in a little more detail. This is a rod. This is the most sensitive uh, uh, cell in our eye. It can detect a single photon. And it has a whole bunch of detectors lined up together. This is a cone. It's not quite as sensitive, but it does a better job of discriminating between red, blue, and green light. And with those, it can paint the entire color. Um, comment. What if, yeah, you know why the cone is cone shaped? No, I don't. Um, anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the biochemistry in a little more visual way than, than, than Behe did, but basically following his, his lead. Um, <clears throat> That is vitamin A. It has a hydroxyl group on the end of a long uh, polyunsaturated uh, group there um, that's unsaturated close enough to be actually re the resonant with itself. Now, that's retinol. That's the vitamin A that you eat. By the way, beta carotene has this hydroxyl group off and there are two of these strung together and the body is able to cleave right in the middle and create two molecules of vitamin A for every molecule of beta carotene you eat. Uh, there's retinal, which instead of the hydroxyl group has an aldehyde group. Um, this bond right there can be flipped so that you get something that goes down instead of um, sideways. That's 11 cis retinal. And then, there, then the next thing we need to discuss is a protein. Now I'm not going to go through the detail of a protein yet. We'll come back to that. But um, that's the bond that has been flipped. And you can see that instead of coming and going straight here, it goes down. Um, there's a protein that's called opsin, and if you put that 11 cis retinal in it, it becomes rhodopsin. Now, I've just drawn it as a blob. We're going to come back to it in much more detail. Uh, but first, 
The idea is that this eleven cis retinal um, gets rid of an oxygen and two hydrogens and actually bonds to a nitrogen, which is lysine sticking out there, part of the protein. And if light hits it, it flips and it changes the shape of the rhodopsin, and it's now called metarhodopsin 2. Let's go through that a little more slowly. Light comes down, hits, and suddenly it straightens out, and when it does, it changes the shape. I've exaggerated the change a little bit so you can see it easier. It's actually not just sitting there floating in the cytoplasm, it's part of the membrane, which is why those rods and cones have membranes that stack back and forth and back and forth. They're trying to get as much membrane as they can. Good share of this stuff happens at the membrane. Some of it happens in the cytoplasm. But what will happen is light will come down and it will be captured and that retinol will change shape retinal, and it will change the shape of the uh, protein in which it is bound. There's a few other things that need to be put in there in order to make this work. It's not just enough to have that thing change shape. Um, you have to have some way of, of magnifying it. So there is, there is a compound called transferrin, which consists of three units. Um, two of which have tails that kind of anchor themselves to the uh, membrane. Um, but it's kind of, the membrane is fluid, so it can kind of float around. Um, if it happens to be near one of these rhodopsins, well, before we get to there, um, there is a GDP stuck to it. If it happens to get close to the rhodopsin, one of the units will separate from the other two and the GDP will drop off. GDP, I've kind of schematically drawn it here. It's not, um, I mean, again, we can go through a lot more detail than this um, because this is something we actually know about. Um, I, I'm going to move the rest of the molecule over a little ways. What will happen is that the uh, GDP will come off and GTP will go into it. And then when that happens, the transferrin, that first part of the transferrin, will change shape. And it's a, probably a subtle change, but it is enough to where another aspect of this will take place. Um, the transferrin can now move away from the rhodopsin and allow other transferrins to get into that same spot so that when we get done, one uh, rhodopsin that has changed to metarhodopsin 2 can do perhaps a hundred or more uh, transferrins before it gets stopped, which we'll see eventually it does. Um, uh, there's a, a compound called cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase, quite a mouthful. And it is also sitting in the membrane, and it has two subunits itself, one of which prevents the other one from working. It's kind of in the way. Um, but uh, that one can occasionally diffuse away, and if it happens to diffuse near the transferrin, it gets stuck. And that leaves the rest of this to um, open to, to do what it's supposed to do. And what it's supposed to do is take cyclic GMP and take it and change it into regular GMP. It cuts one of the bonds. That's why it's called a, uh, a phosphodiesterase, because there are two bonds and it cuts one of them. And when it comes out, it's just regular old GDP. What that does, and of course this, this can do many of, uh, per molecule, this can do many of it as well. So here's another area of magnification. So you get one to 100 to maybe 10,000 or more. 
all of a sudden that one little tiny protein has just opened the floodgates. Um, that's GMP and it has one phosphate in it. GDP has two phosphates, GTP has three. Mono and di and triphosphate in case you were wondering. Um, now there's more to the eye than that, of course. There are some ion channels in it, okay? And the ion channels have cyclic GMP stuck to them. They're specially designed to do that. Now what will happen is that when the concentration of cyclic GMP drops, some of those, uh, some of those uh, uh, cyclic GMPs will diffuse off of the ion channel and the ion channel will no longer be able to stay open and it will close. Now normally what happens is that it allows sodium and calcium to go through wherever it wants to go. But when it's closed, the sodium and calcium can't freely go through and so there is another protein, well first of all there are proteins and we're going to give you one example of them and there's one more example coming. Um, rhodopsin kinase is stuck to something called recoverin. And that's stuck to something, uh, that's stuck to calcium. And what happens is once you close off that, that ion channel, the calcium level will drop because of an interesting mechanism. There's a sodium calcium exchanger. There's a lot more sodium than calcium on the outside and sodium tries to get inside it. But this thing will only let the sodium go in if calcium comes out. And so the calcium has to come off of this complex here uh, and that complex breaks apart, leaving the kinase to go up to the rhodopsin and phosphorylate it. Now if you were looking carefully you might have seen that something else appears here because to try to keep things clean, I've introduced things one at a time. In reality, all of these things are there together. And once the, uh, uh, the kinase has put the phosphorus on the metarhodopsin 2, it backs off and a compound called arrestin, which kind of implies what's going on, will go up and glom on to that compound. Then the arrestin will allow the uh, vitamin A, uh, retinol, retinol right now, to drop off and there's a series of three enzymes that allows the, uh, that first changes the retinol to retinol, or vitamin A itself, and then moves it to the second enzyme, which takes the retinol and bends it at the 11 position, and then takes the third enzyme, changes the 11 cis retinol back into 11 cis retinol, which now, um, if the, uh, arrestin manages to get free, which it does eventually, allows the, um, uh, the now empty rhodopsin to pull 11 cis retinal back in, attach it again, and be ready for the next um, uh, light photon. However, there's still a little cleanup to do. We have to get the phosphate out. That will take another enzyme. I'm not going to bother to draw that one because they're all around and they, they do this all the time. And um, the uh, transferrin will swap its GTP for GDP. When it does that, it changes, it, it is able to bind a little better and it changes shape and that little cap pops off and goes back to where it was supposed to blocking the phosphodiesterase. 
And there's another calcium related protein, um, which is called guanyl cyclase, that produces cyclic GMP. Basically, when the calcium leaves, which it eventually will do because the ion channel is still closed, um, this compound will take GTP, cut off a of pyrophosphate, stick um, that part back to, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, GMP that's left and make it a cyclic GMP. And then that cyclic GMP can go back and open the uh, ion channel again, allowing calcium to come back in and uh, allowing the uh, recoverin to bind back to the uh, uh, phosphokinase and allowing the uh, stopping the work of the uh, the uh, guanylyl cyclase. Uh, in the meantime, that GMP has a couple of phosphates added back to it and turns into GTP so that we have mostly GTP in the cell most of the time. And of course, the next thing that happens is we have another photon coming in and changing the rhodopsin to metarhodopsin 2. So we have this nice little cycle that has all kinds of stuff going on. Okay, <clears throat> now I've drawn them rather crudely. Um, I'm going to show you what they look like in terms of molecular backbone structure first and then this is rhodopsin here with the with a straight form of, uh, of vitamin A in the middle. And this is transducin sitting here with uh, the alpha unit, the beta unit which doesn't have a tail, and the gamma unit which does. So you can see they're a lot more complicated than my little simple drawings. Um, and in fact, it gets worse. You see these, those look like just nice little red spirals. They actually, according to uh, Hargrave, um, look like this. And every time you see a letter here, it means an amino acid and it's a, a different one and they have different side chains. If I were to draw you the whole thing, it would be just mind-boggling to think of how complex that thing is. Okay. Now that is what you have to explain with a simple eye spot. Think about that. You know, Darwin compared the eye spot with life originating. Wasn't a bad comparison, actually. Um, so I did a little reading at one point into um, uh, rhodopsins. That's just that one little protein. That's not the rest of them, okay? And uh, it turns out there are bacterial rhodopsins. Turns out none of them are related to the vertebrate rhodopsin. There are two kinds of rhodopsin, type 1 and type 2, which are structurally similar, perform related functions, but it is unclear whether they're evolutionary related. Presumably because of minimal amino acid homology. Also, according to the article, although the information is insufficient to determine the evolutionary history of all these genes, at least one episode of horizontal transfer is suggested by the close similarity of some eukaryotic and gamma proteobacterial rhodopsins. Horizontal transfer between bacteria and eukaryotes. Think about this for a minute. Type 1 and type 2 rhodopsin in the same organism of apparently no amino acid, uh, my misspelling, 
homology. But type 1 rhodopsin is, is completely different, pardon me, in completely different kingdoms, is closely related. So close as to suggest recent gene sharing. Gene transfer is, in fact, functionally indistinguishable from common design. Basically, this is an admission that at least some genes are grossly misleading when taken as evidence of common descent. You want to find out whether things are related, you find out whether they have the same genes. This is bats and whales on steroids. With the invocation of horizontal transfer, there can be no genetic evidence that cannot be accommodated by evolutionary theory. Does naturalistic evolution even make soft predictions in this area? Is it testable? Not? Well, if it is, I guess you could say it's failing the test. Furthermore, bacterial and rice rhodopsins are similar. These considerations, quoting the article again, suggest that the strong similarity of the putative ariza, that's rice, and parasitic sequences to gamma proteobacterial rhodopsins cannot be explained by conventional vertical transmission. Translation, common descent will not account for this. It's too close. Therefore, we have really promiscuous horizontal transmission. Bacteria and rice get it on. What can I say? However, some of the data are interpreted more straightforwardly, although still straining evolutionary theory. The latter, quoting the latter results, suggests that the duplication that gave rise to the two main groups of fungal genes is older than, uh, my misspelling, than the Ascomites basidiomites split. A reference is, I think that's about two billion years ago, something like that. The authors struggled to explain their data. We are therefore left with two reasonable alternatives. First, we can interpret that high similarity as supporting a, uh, that high similarity as supporting a relatively recent horizontal transmission. Um, design transmission, maybe? Second, those sequences may be rhodopsins of proteobacterial origin annotated as belonging to eukaryotic species. Um, maybe they just goofed and they had uh, proteo, proto, proteobacterial origin uh, of the genes that just popped into the eukaryotes uh, in the laboratory, I guess. However, we were still left with a second problem. How species that belong to two evolutionary, very distinct groups, dinoflagellates and plants, can have proteins that are so similar? Think about that. The rice and bacteria is not a one-off. There are other ones like it. The summary on page 357 states, however, our results do not fully dismiss the possibility of several ancient horizontal transfers involving totally unrelated organisms. In summary, we envision th uh, three main alternatives. I want you to notice that none of them are standard evolution. Number one, extremely ancient origins plus a single recent horizontal transfer. I think that's the rice. Type 1 rhodopsin predates the split separating eubacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. It's found in all three groups. Eubacteria, the ordinary bacteria. Archaea are the bacteria that, uh, that like to live in really strange environments like really hot or salty ones. And eukaryotes, of course, are, are cells with a nucleus, which means plants and animals. And a single horizontal transfer event occurred between eukaryotes and proteobacteria. That would be the rice. In this case, we must postulate multiple losses in many independent lineages. Such a useful thing, and it just keeps getting lost. Two, ancient horizontal transfer to archaea plus symbiosis. Archaea or 
bacteria that got swallowed and turned into mitochondria, I guess. Um, type road uh, plus recent horizontal transfer. So you have to have recent horizontal transfer. Type 1 rhodopsins originated in U bacteria and were later horizontally transferred to Achaea. They were transferred to eukaryotes by symbiosis because they were uh, present in the bacterial ancestors of mitochondria, alpha proteobacteria, and chloroplast, cyanobacteria. However, only a few lineages still conserve these genes. All that use, usefulness going to waste. Fungi, derived from mitochondria, and organisms green algae, cryptomonads, dinoflagellates, de derived from the ancestral cyanobacteria eukaryote symbiosis that generated chloroplasts containing eukaryotes or that ob obtained cyanobacterial genes through secondary symbiosis. It didn't just happen once, it happened twice or more. And they have some references for that conjecture. Three, Two or more ancient high horizontal transfers plus a recent horizontal transfer. So, remember horizontal transfer is supposed to be rare. And two, it's phenomenologically indistinguishable from common design. You are stuck with something that looks like common design. And it's hard to explain otherwise. And there's another article that I'll pull out bacterial rhodopsins evolution of a mechanistic model for the ion pumps. And again, you can get this on the internet. Um, and just a few observations there. Uh, one bacterial rhodopsin pumps hydrogen ions from the inside to the outside of a cell. So it does something entirely different from the vision one. Halo rhodopsin pumps chloride, usually from the outside to the inside and has extensive homologies to bacterial rhodopsins. So maybe they could have evolved from each other, one from the other, I guess. So conceivably, they're evolutionarily related. There's also a sensory rhodopsin one, extensively homologous to bacterial rhodopsin that mediates light avoidance. Sensory rhodopsin two exists, although apparently not much is known about it, and there are an increasing number of BR-like proton pumps isolated from other strains of halobacteria. So we're finding this stuff, you know, just really inventive all the way through uh, the micro world. These function differently from the vertebrate rhodopsin that helps us to see. They still use retinol, related to vitamin A, but the retinol bends at a different point. And pumps ions directly through the membrane rather than serving as part of a catalyst for cyclic GMP lysis. Although at least some of the bacterial rhodopsins, BR and halorhodopsin, BR and second sensory rhodopsin one, have extensive homologies to each other and therefore could be evolutionarily related, the bacterial rhodopsins apparently have no obvious sequence homologies with vert vertebrate rhodopsins. Vertebrate no, rhodopsins are brand new, suggesting that they arose independently. So bacterial rhodopsins are irrelevant for any proposed origin of the vertebrate rhodopsin cycle. So you imagine this light sensitive spot, already you have this huge complicated mechanism. Now, in the vertebrate rhodopsin cycle, several biochemical entities are needed, including retinal, 11 cis vitamin A aldehyde, rhodopsin that can bind to transducin. It, it's not enough to just have a rhodopsin, it has to have actually a binding site for transducin so that it can multiply its influence. Transducin itself, phosphodiesterase, Responsive ion channels, they have to react to cyclic GMP so that you can get this stuff working, and that's the second multiplier. A sodium calcium exchanger, a guanylate cyclase, metarhodopsin kinase and restor restorin, and arrestin to stop this, because otherwise you'd hit it once and then you, uh, the cell would forever not be able to register light again. And of course you have to have various enzymes capable of rebending retinol in the correct place. 
And you have some other ones, but those are kind of housekeeping genes, so I'm not going to worry too much about them. Guanylate cyclase is used for other functions in vertebrate cells, so maybe that's something that could be that way. Thus, its origin is not directly relevant. Vitamin A appears to have been used first for vision, apparently not for anything else other than these bacterial rhodopsins. The origin of the biochemical pathway for its production is unclear. If I can translate, we have no idea how the pathway got started unless it was designed. And you know we can't tolerate that. Ion channels presumably need minimal modification to be responsive to cyclic GMP, and this could have happened ahead of an independent division if you stretch it a little. Maybe that was a lucky break. Without further information, rhodopsin transducin, metarhodopsin kinase, arrestin, cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase, and the enzyme for bending retinol and oxidizing to 11 cis retinol all had to be created de novo. We have no clue as to where those ones came from. And we have a pretty good backlog. Maybe one of them we'll find out has a parallel somewhere else, but I doubt that all of them do. The enzyme capable of turning transretinal into retinol could have come later. Initially, the cell could just have used new retinol, retinol, but it would have to be under very low light conditions so that it could steal it from someplace else. Maybe some of the bacteria that are making it, I don't know. Um, however, those enzymes themselves would form an irreducibly complex system. You don't have them all in place, nothing happens. Unless they demonstrate homology with some other protein, they also have to have arisen de novo. But opsin is also found in marine worms and primitive vertebrates. Uh, this eye spot goes all the way back to the beginning of uh, vertebrates. And some of the marine worm worms that are related to them, apparently. Transducin has sequence homology to transducins used for taste. So... Yeah, but then which came first, the taste or the eyesight? Somewhere you had to do it new. Cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase has no known hom homolo uh, homologs. That leaves metarhodopsin kinase, arrestin, and the enzyme for bending retinol and oxidizing it to 611 cis retinol. Looks to me like we have irreducible complexity. You don't have the system, it doesn't work. You don't have all the parts to the system, or at least most of the parts to the system. It doesn't work. And a system that cannot reasonably be formed by, as Darwin put it, numerous successive slight modifications. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment, uh, Jack Stout. <clears throat> that was an that was an interesting, uh, a very good presentation of this process. Uh, this this pathway in the in the class I taught most the, the class I've taught the most um, occupies a lot of time for the students to understand. What strikes me is. Number one, the availability of rhodopsin, I'm sorry, the availability of retinol is ubiquitous. It doesn't need to come from some other group. What is really striking about this is that in the bacteria, there's a very simple pump, a proton pump, as you mentioned, yeah. that pumps protons from, from inside to outside. Mm -hmm. The role of retinol there is simply to change its shape. In, yeah. one, in one shape, it plugs up that channel so proton pumping doesn't happen. The proton pumping has nothing to do with the opsin, which is the real genius of the uh, animal system. And the really big problem of trying to figure out where the opsin came from. That's an, ex as you pointed out, uh, that's an opsin. extremely complex protein. Yeah. And the major p function of the yeah. opsin is to open and close a sodium pump. 
and it is the change in internal sodium that changes the membrane potential of rods or cones and leads to vision. And uh, you did, didn't particularly mention that aspect no. of it, but the sodium flow across the membrane of the eye or the eye spot right. you is to, the real genius of the system. Yeah, it, you change the, change the voltage and then you get a signal out of the rod. Incidentally, if I, if I may just insert parenthetically, when I started uh, teaching this quite a few years ago, uh, I thought back to my childhood. I'm old enough to have remembered what happened during World War II. And during World War II, we had air raid practices, and they had air raid wardens who would walk around the community, and if they saw light coming from any crack in a house, they'd go up and you could get fined for allowing any light to go out. And uh, of course, when I started teaching you, I thought, now wait a minute, it, is that a little ridiculous? So I looked up the sensitivity of the human eye, and a, on a very clear night, a single match lit can be seen five miles away. And when you do the physics, it says that the eye is responding to single photons. Yeah. You have to have them coming in frequently enough to do it. As I said, the, the genius of the system is the opsin, which was hardly mentioned. And the, the retinol, goodness, you can get it from almost anywhere. You don't need to borrow that for a bacterial thing. Yeah, uh, but, but if, you, if you don't recycle it, then uh, once you come out into the sunlight, uh, you're blind for a while. Sure. All those are adaptations for a very, very different system than, yeah. than the bacteria use. A comment over here. In Behe's book, I like the analogy that he uses of a Rube Goldberg device where, uh, you know, the ball drops on a, on a balance and it tips the balance and it, uh, you know, drops a hammer onto something else and it, you know, the mechanism just keeps going and going and every little piece of the mechanism is vitally important to, you know, dumping the milk into the cereal at the end or whatever is the ultimate goal. Um, and uh, view, I think it was just helpful when you're going through all these biochemical things. It's interesting that there's so many of these Rube Goldberg type biochemical pathways that have to work for uh, a lot of things that he was talking about, blood clotting and uh, this one and everything else that he mentioned in the book. Yeah, uh, there's, there's multiple steps. And the thing of it is that the steps are actually necessary because in order to get the kind of sensitivity that you need, you need to depolarize the membrane enough to where the next cell can sense it, which means you need a multiplication factor and you have two of them in that Rube Goldberg device. It's not just, you know, that you go complicated to complicated to complicated. At some point, you get complicated, and then it spreads out suddenly a hundredfold. And then the next next branch, suddenly you have a hundredfold spread after that, or maybe a thousandfold. I don't know how how fast um, the uh, uh, phosphodiesterase works before it gets uh, shut down again, but I imagine that it's probably um, well over a thousand. But the transfer, uh, transducin is a hundredfold according to the literature. Um, so, so the Rube Goldberg is actually necessary in order to make it work. It's not, it's not optional. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, it has to be something that, that has this kind of effect. Yes, and then here, go ahead. I have a World War II story also, but I was born right at the end of World War II, so it's a family story. Um, before I was born, um, my parents in 1944 were on a ship going as missionaries from New York City uh, by way of Lisbon, Portugal, around South Africa and the east coast of Africa. And uh, they were on a neutral ship, but still neutral ships were being sunk. 
So the family story is that when they um, landed at Lorenzo Mark on the east coast of Africa, I forget the modern name, but it's along there, one of those countries, Mauritania or one of those there, uh, East Africa, uh, they had to leave to go to Egypt at nighttime and they were told um, uh, to be very careful and not even light a cigarette because if they were on the deck of a ship and they had lit a cig cigarette, it would uh, perhaps doom the entire vessel because of uh, sensitivity of German subs that were in the area in the seas and there were ships being sunk even to the east coast of Africa. So um, that illustrates what Jack just said, uh, the sensitivity of the human eye. And if you look at the animal world, there are animals that have very sensitive eyes and in the bird world, the eye of an eagle is, I don't know, how many times more powerful than even the human eye. And the, owl of, uh, the eye of an owl is way more sensitive too. Yeah. So uh, the whole animal kingdom has some of this. Now I have a question of ignorance and that's we're dealing with opsin. Is that something pretty much ubiquitous in the animal world for functioning of cells, especially if there's a cell wall? How, how many organisms, do most organisms have to have opsin at some point in their metabolism? Opsin is specifically designed to utilize the properties of vitamin A. Okay. Um, there are different kinds of opsins. There are bacterial uh, opsins of four different kinds at least, and mm -hmm. probably more that we don't know about. Um, none of those have a sequence relationship with the rhodopsin invertebrates. Okay. Now to be fair, the rhodopsin invertebrates is pretty much all the way through. So if you could evolve it for lampreys or something like that, once you got that far, you could probably evolve it for, um, um, for uh, you know, an anything else including people, eagles and owls. Mm -hmm. Once you got that far, you'd be fine. But um, but you still, you have to get that far. And, and the problem is that the simple eye spot <coughs> has this huge mechanism inside of it. And at least a good share of that mechanism is necessary in order to get the magnification from one rhodopsin changing its shape to sending out a signal big enough for the next cell to pick up. That's the key. So what you're saying is to go from opsin in bacteria to rhodopsin in vertebrates, for example, it ain't that's happened. an unbridgeable gap. Yeah. There is no evolutionary pathway known that will go from exactly. A to B to C. Now, you can always do Darwin of the gaps if you want to, you know. We'll find one someday that's, you know, 60% bacterial but also 60% human. But, you know, you're relying on faith when you do that. Uh, faith in the teeth of the evidence. Uh. I'm struck by two, two things here. One uh, excellent diagram, this was great, what you presented. Uh, did each one of these have survival value as it evolved? Uh, but sit there and depolarize all the cells you want to, what do you do if a cell has been depolarized? Uh, after that, what, what good is that unless you have something to respond to that? You have to brain to process the information. If you don't have the brain, the eyes are no good. Uh, you're not going to have any survival value until you have some response to it. And uh, you have to have nerves to transfer it to the brain and, and uh, something in the brain to interpret it and so on. Uh, the thing, 
you can hope, but man, uh, this seems uh, totally impossible. We, we can't use that word impossible, at least almost impossible, uh, to occur by, by chance, no matter how much time you have. It's, it's, uh, well, that's a problem. Even to get uh, 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 vertebrate rhodopsin itself is a major hurdle because uh, there aren't any analogs that you could evolve earlier in bacteria. Yeah, but you can have all the rhodopsin you want. That's not going to help unless you've got all those not other things. Not until you have the transferrin and not until, yeah. I mean, the, the more uh, you think about it, the, the more you have, um, it's, you know, it, it's a really a pretty decent illustration of something that's irreducibly complex. And yes, you could have some all-purpose parts in it. You do have all-purpose parts in it. And, and for those, you have to be fair and say, you know, and you use a screw to hold the, the, the plate on. And screws are a dime a dozen. And of course, somewhere in the, uh, you had to originate the screw to begin with, you know. But, but that's, you know, what you are seeing is people who are looking at design that's staring them in the face, that they admit is staring them in the face. Mm -hmm. It sure looks like design. What they're doing is they're saying, but it can't be, so there must be some explanation for it other than design, so we're going to go with the best non-design explanation. And if we can't explain it, we will put it on the shelf and come back to it later. Now, interestingly, these same people will tell me that if there's something out there that I can't explain, that I should just fold. But they only have 600 million years to do it in. No, they have three billion. Well, that's true. That's true. You, have to, uh, you probably have one billion for the, for the vertebrate eye. But that's all. And and, the, and 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 we don't we don't have eyes that back. They, they they just assume that by assuming certain rates of evolution. Four hundred million years of that is vaporware because we can't find the organisms. <laughs> that is correct. Yes, comment. And and were you one? Okay. I want to know how a photon can bend a protein in a picosecond. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that is a matter of quantum mechanics. Um, um, well and if you think you understand quantum mechanics, it's good evidence that you don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that, by the way, is not my quote. Perhaps by way of attempting to answer that question is, you see, photon is really a packet of energy. Right. When a packet of energy strikes an electron in its appropriate energy level. And it raises it an to electron an, that goes all the way across the That's organ. right. It, it's in an, in an electron pair bond. And it strikes that electron. The electron goes to a higher energy level. A higher energy level means the bond can now be altered. Hence, the transformation. Yeah, you would knock that electron up into a higher shell, but then you still have to get the angular momentum of the well, whole tail of that protein to, to switch 90 degrees. Well, it's actually a little bit like a mouse trap. You know, if you give enough energy to the, the trap mechanism, there's pent up energy that's ready to just spring, but it's being held in place because it can't get over an energy barrier. You hit it with enough energy to go over that barrier and suddenly it jumps down and goes all the way. Yeah, it would have to be because there could not be enough energy from just a single photon to lift that much mass or change the, the, moment, the moment arm of that much of a protein. Well, that's why in the, in the reloading cycle, you saw that, that there was an enzyme to change it to retinol uh, and then uh, enzyme to bend it, which probably takes energy. 
it probably uh, takes uh, phosphate energy to do that. And then there's another enzyme that, bent, that takes that bent, puts it so back to retinal, and then, and then ships it back to the rhodopsin. And so the rhodopsin is actually getting a loaded spring, just ready to go, so that when the photon hits it, bam, it straightens out. Yeah, it would be interesting to would calculate we, that. We, Go ahead and then uh, when if it would be interesting to back. be able to calculate what the loaded spring constant would be in in that mechanism and to understand how much you know the mass of that tail is and in order to get that over that sort of a time frame i mean the, that spring mass has to be very you know strong as as yeah. it were oh it is strong it is strong come in back here. <clears throat> there is an excellent real-world example of this. It's called a self-opening umbrella. You push a button and the whole umbrella springs into action, but then you have to reload it when you close the umbrella, and that's where you store the energy. Okay, comment over here. It has occurred to me while we're discussing all this that we are demonstrating a wonderful example of yet another sensation that we haven't paid attention to today, which is at least as equally wonderful, and that is the hearing. I read in, I remember reading about this, that it would take 10 people speaking continually uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for an entire year to produce in enough energy to warm one cup of tea. So then you begin to ask yourself, how sensitive are the ears to hear the very low level sound energy that is transmitted? This is a really, really fascinating area. Uh, you mentioned early on a, a suggestion that perhaps a pain receptor would get transformed by, in, in responding to light by some mechanism. Uh, my immediate thought was that'd be very interesting if the, if the evolution of light sensitivity arrived by creating pain that would be destructive to the organism. How long do you have to wait for the neural pathway to change so you can use that information? Well, it is interesting to think about all the intermediate steps that would get halfway there or quarter way there and then get erased because they weren't of any service to the organism and the organism was spending all of its uh, metabolic energy maintaining these proteins that were at the present time freeloaders. And really not until you get this thing 90% or 99% or something like that functional do you start getting your payoff. Yeah, one other comment and the questioning about uh, how do you recock rhodopsin. Actually, I don't believe there's any energy brought to the opsin part, but Molecules exist at different energy states. The higher energy state is the state in which retinal fits and then stabilizes in that. So all you have to do is change the shape of the retinal that releases the opsin to go to its low energy configuration, which is open. Which is the all transform, the straight one. Yes. So there's, there isn't a lot of mystery about how you get it there. It's just it has to, you have to have enough energy yeah. uh, in the varying levels of energy. Of, in other words, opsin is kind of doing this. Uh -huh. And it's stabilized in its, in its uh, higher energy form by retinol. It's, it's, it's fascinating to think at how efficient. Oh, well, actually, the bent form is the, is the retinal. And there's a special enzyme for that. But I'm just talking about the opsin, which is the, 
Yeah. Well, the, the option itself, of course, can accommodate either one. And, you know, if it's straight, why it uh, has something sticking out, I suppose. Um, I mean, we don't really understand all the the mechanism there, but uh, then if it's bent, why the shape conforms to the bend? I guess why I'm saying there's no, there's no delivery of energy via you know, a high energy phosphate to the opsin to make it get ready to bind retinal. We don't know that for sure. I think you're right. I think that the opsin can the the Retinal can simply diffuse into the opsin and find a little. The P part is in getting the retinal. Retinal. To go to retinal. That's where the ATP yeah, is used. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, the truth of the matter is, we don't know as much as we think we do, so we should probably be careful uh, about saying too much. One, one final comment, and I'll be quiet. Uh, to me, one of the most telling analogies that come out, comes out of Behe's book is his talking about a super highway with say 20 lanes with very heavy traffic and the probability of a rat running randomly across there and making it to the other side yeah i, I think he was talking about with each lane being one of the steps necessary to accomplish right. this and, and it, it and, really and, brings home the improbability of it all yeah and at a certain point you say don't even think about going to the other side you're not going to make it you're just not uh, it's theoretically possible that you could, but no, nah, not really. <laughs> Which explains why most of the time, why most of the time you see roadkill off to the right side. You don't see very much roadkill onto the left lane. That's right. You That's know. right. Because they never make it. We have a comment back there. Um, Every now and then you see totally unbelievable things. Um, I don't remember how many years ago this happened, probably seven or eight at least, uh, coming back on the 91 freeway through the Anaheim Hills area, uh, rush hour after dark. Um, I was probably in the second lane from the left, and not counting whichever high occupancy lanes there was, and there was, as I remember, a rabbit that was crossing the freeway. Um, he made it past my lane in the next, but then I lost view of him. I tried to see him in his rear view, and I, in my rear view, I said, there's no way that guy's ever going to make it, but I don't know how he made it to this lane. <laughs> he was going from the center to the to the outside edge. I said, I don't believe I just saw what I saw. Yeah. Well, it's a little easier to believe with rabbits. Turtles? Uh-uh. <laughs> not, not with an 18-wheeler, they can't. Comment? Yeah, your discussion today uh, it makes me go back and think about the beautiful text in, uh, in uh, Psalms 139, 13 and 14. I shared this with Muslims and Hindus or whoever I talk with. I'll praise you and honor you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You formed me in my mother's womb. And the Lord says, I have many other things to tell you, but I cannot tell you now what all he wanted to tell the folk. You mm -hmm. see, th this makes us think, yeah, he's yeah. the one who created us. But we want a bypass, oh, that's too simplistic. Let's leave it alone. We are smart people, we are gods, <laughs> you see. Uh, Ellen White, I mean, you know how many years ago, 100 years ago, the doctors used to say asthma. If you have asthma, you smoke cigarettes. It's your cure, even less than 100 years ago. Lucky, yeah, smoke Lucky cigarette. Strike was advertised as a treatment for bronchitis. There, right. You see, then uh, uh, how did this crazy woman in the eyes of many Adventists say, don't touch pizza, I mean cheese, pizza. You see, why did she and how did she know all of these things? You see, 
you, you walk in the ER, a patient will tell you, whatever you do, don't take the Viagra from me. 47 years old, you were younger. I mean, we, we, we suffer from chronic illnesses, okay? And these are all have one basis that's called inflammation. What's going through your mouth really causes the inflammation in 70,000 miles of blood vessels that we have in our bodies, you see? And the stress that we perceive, the sleeplessness that we go through. We have about 20,000 uh, genes in our bodies. About one third of it is affected by lack of sleep and not the right time to sleep. We are absolutely fearfully and wonderfully made. You see, and I think it is important for us who believe, um, and as you go and speak to young people in Australia, I just pray that you get to telling them, look, look guys, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. If I can kind of pull some of this together now, if you're talking about people, uh, or you're talking to people about the design of the eye, the design of the eye is wonderful. And it is there for people who want to see it. Uh, the gross design of the eye can be ignored. Partly because we don't have the right information. We don't know how many biochemical steps it takes to take this retina and curve it around and put a lens in front of it and put, uh, we don't know those answers. And so if somebody wants to, they can believe that it's pretty simple. The biochemistry, there's no way, way around that. That is information, pure and simple. It's down far enough to where we actually understand what's going on. I rather suspect that the more we understand, the more we will realize that the project of explaining the universe without God is a hopeless one. Um, and I don't even think you really have to argue that so much. You just find as much evidence as you can, you present it. And, you know, because, because the resistance to God himself. Creation, we're not quite in that same category, I don't think, yet. Um, but I think the resistance to God himself, the, the, the idea that the universe can just run on its own, is actually a proposition without really good material evidence and it is it is theologically driven maybe one of these days I'll pull out uh, some of the quotes to show you that it's theologically driven because what's really happening is people are saying for whatever reason and there are all kinds of reasons for it they're saying I don't want there to be a God so I will do everything I can to avoid that. Um, now again, um, getting God is not the same as getting short age creation. And we should be careful never to make that claim. But just that there is somebody upstairs who knows what's going on and who is capable of design and who's, who cares enough about life to put some incredible designs in. That is kind of obvious in your face. And I think we have a right to believe that comfortably. And we have a right to invite other people to believe that as well. I would just simply add, once you put God in there, you have changed your horizon completely. Uh, if you open that door, all kinds of things can happen. Yes. Well, come back next week. Ariel Roth has the floor.